Greetings, viewers. Once again, we welcome Nick Griffin, England's equivalent to, equivalent to anyone but Keir Starmer, an old school <laughs> veteran nationalist who has been there and done that so he doesn't have to listen to your bullshit. The same could be and will be said of Australia's equivalent, Dr. Jim Salem. Now, Donald Trump. Is Nick there? I'm here. Sorry. Donald Trump. Yeah, sorry about that. I completely went missing there. Well, there's a screwed up intro and I was so amusing. Now, let's first begin by divesting you of your uh, horoscopic credentials. Allow me to read from a passage from my book, which you uh, contributed to, which is uh, the Australian Nationalist White Book, which is available for a very reasonable price on Amazon. Uh -huh. And you said two years ago, given the scale of the uh, demographic change in the USA, coupled with institutionalised electoral fraud, there is no way that Trump should be able to win in anything like normal circumstances. There again, the economic and financial situation is now so dire that normal is very unlikely to return to America. So I don't know if that was two bob each way. I think that was I, I was a couple of quid each way actually. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of quid. Yeah, indeed, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Obviously, I how abnormal is America in economic terms? They they've had a pretty bad four years. Um, the demographic change has gone through, which I was saying meant that Trump probably couldn't win. But the real unexpected thing happened, of course. And Trump won because of millions of Latino voters, primarily male ones, voting for Trump. So the, the biggest electoral fraud that the Democrats have perpetrated is a mass gerrymandering, bringing in millions of new immigrants, particularly Latinos, to vote for them. And these actually quite conservative with a small C Latinos with a sort of a macho culture, especially amongst the men, simply turned around and voted, in fact, a majority for Trump, which swung it. To what extent they did that because of, I suppose, the, the cultural elements near their opposition to things like the trans agenda of the Democrats, and to what extent they did it because over the last four years, they have seen their living the standard standards decline as much as other Americans have. Yeah, I don't know, but it, it did the job. So my couple of quid each way, <laughs> it, it worked. But I, to be honest, two years ago, I would have said Trump can't win this. Really and truly. Oh, you, you, you yeah. did sort of say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did more or less say that. But yeah. I didn't see and no one saw coming this phenomenal switch of the immigrant vote to Trump, which does actually say a great deal, I think, we'll perhaps come on to this. It says a great deal about where nationalists are going to be in electoral terms in a few years' time elsewhere as well. But it's certainly a very major development. Uh, well, um, to, uh, to be a bit facetious here, does this prove democracy works? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it certainly proves yet again that the electorate are not as stupid as politicians think. None of them. Uh, and especially near the, the, the sheer contempt that the Democrats actually have, a racist contempt for their uh, for their coloured clients in thinking they'll vote for us whatever we do. Um, you know, basically they've got no choice and they're very stupid. Uh, and as I said, they didn't do. Um, does it show that democracy works? Well, I think in a couple of years' time, assuming that Biden and co don't manage to spark World War Three over the next, next few months, in a couple of years' time, I expect that nationalists, hardcore proper nationalists, will have all sorts of complaints against Donald Trump and will say, you know, really the man's absolutely appalling, should never have been elected. And I still think at that stage, you still got to think, look back and think, well, bad as he may be, he is nothing like as bad as Harris would have been. Jim, people power? 
Well, it's obviously an indicator, I agree with Nick, that uh, you can't fool everybody all the time. And uh, it's very clear a lot of people have um, brought vengeance back. Let's be quite frank. The, the Democratic Party is not a party of the poor. It's not a party of uh, workers or something like that. It's a facade. The Democratic Party, in many ways, even more than the Republican Party, is a party of huge capital. And it always has been from the days of Roosevelt and, uh, and so forth. That's been, its, uh, that's been its marker. When a lot of people, as we do, complain about the deep state and the Paris state and all that in the United States, uh, the Democrats are often the people who've set this up um, and they're the people who benefit from it. You've only got to mention the, the old classic groups like Council for Foreign Relations or something like that, and it comes up Democrats. The banking elite, it always came up Democrats. So I think that there was a, uh, a, a generalised uh, anger across the board in America, uh, all ethnic groups, all, all, uh, all people against that elite in the United States. And ironically, Trump may indeed be a billionaire and in his own way, he, he's got a ticket to go into the elite's uh, privileged places and spaces whenever he chooses. But at the same time, uh, there is a maverick factor about Donald Trump. Is he a product of that type of American capitalism we used to know back in the 1920s? Maybe he is. Uh, maybe that survives in America and voila, you can get an independent maverick figure who can actually mobilise a clientele against privileged institutions and groups. Um, that's my thought on that. Okay, well, um, the deep state um, seems to be in America proving uh, one of my predictions, which we uh, had on a uh, you know uh, previous uh, interview. Um, and I said that uh, rather, you know, to spite Trump, they'll try to start World War Three. Mm -hmm. And um, right at the moment, it's quite uh, concerning. But I, I ask this of both of you: Is it more concerning for all of us, or should uh, Ukraine be the most concerned? Um, because obviously, the election of Trump will have to factor somewhere into uh, Putin's reasoning of response because it narrows down uh, who these antagonists actually are and should measure his response. Uh, but that doesn't hold for uh, Ukraine or Zelensky who uh, might well feel his full wrath your thought yeah. okay well i think that ukraine well ukraine's lost the war nato has lost the war in conventional terms that's without a doubt uh putin i think now has no uh, option but to respond very firmly to the decision to start using ballistic missiles against targets within russia itself uh, so he might not do it within 24 hours, but within 36, 48, if he doesn't, he will look weak, weak, and he encourages NATO to do more of the same. Uh, and since uh, the last wave, it's now what, some it's many months ago, since the last wave of really aggressive NATO attacks on Russian targets, they were taking out not so much uh, equipment which is being used in this war, we might have talked about this before actually, but they were targeting uh, miss uh, anti-missile batteries which are part of russia's defense against a nato nuclear attack so putin cannot sit back and watch nato chip 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 away at uh russia's capability of fighting a serious a real war uh, over this so therefore he has to respond very vigorously and i think that he will what might he do well he might just obliterate zelensky clearly they have the power and the intelligence uh, if they want to remove, remove Zelensky, they can do so, might do that. But there again, they've been at war with NATO, with um, Zelensky for uh, three years getting on, and they haven't killed him yet. He wouldn't make that much difference to NATO. So I think that what they will do is launch one 
or a series of really effective attacks against NATO targets, whether it's an American run base in uh, Poland, whether it's Ramstein, something like that. They must do something which really makes NATO understand that if we step this up more, that's it. You know, hell is on. So I think that Putin is likely and, and should, in order to keep the peace, he should launch a very de a devastating strike, which is accompanied with a simple message. If you retaliate, if you stop now, we'll regard it as evens and we go back to the normal war in Ukraine. If you retaliate to this, we will retaliate tenfold to whatever you do. And if he does that, he can keep the peace. If he backs down on this, and it turns out that this red line was just talk, then NATO will push even further. And it makes it even more likely we just end up in a full-scale nuclear war. So the only chance of peace now, actually, is for Putin to be tough. Um, it, it's the, the most peaceful possibility would be to draw, particularly Britain, and, the, and hence really part of the core of NATO, up short by doing something such as taking out our ability to get electricity from France because the lights in Britain are now kept on only by electricity imported across the channel. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they closed down the last coal-fired power station in Britain. Our nuclear power stations are on their last legs. I look out of the window here and it's been cloudy. It's very cold. All the solar panels are covered in snow at vast ways of the country. Uh, it's not very windy, so the wind farms are not working. So one simple missile strike on the place in Dover where our electricity comes in from France and Britain is plunged into rolling blackouts. Uh, and that then wouldn't encourage people to think that, oh, you know, this is a, a wicked military strike. They've killed dozens of our poor soldiers. We must go to war. It would make people very angry with Keir Starmer. Simple as that. If Putin pays it, plays it right, then I don't actually think we're in a particularly dangerous place at present because this will rapidly de-escalate. But if he responds as he's entitled to, with a, you know, a really vigorous military response on military bases and lots of American and British servicemen are killed and so on, then World War Three looks, to me now, more likely than not. Jim. Um, Australia, uh, of course, is a, a smaller power and uh, it's always had that uh, uh, psychopathic following of um, greater powers. And uh, our conservative media uh, that links through to our equivalent of your Tories, the Liberal Party here, uh, for a very, very long time, they've been banging the drum for Ukraine and freedom and democracy and uh, all of this business. And uh, now they're confronted with someone who uh, wants to, at least says, he wants to end this uh, war in Ukraine. And what's occurred recently is obviously an attempt by the deep state in the United States to push uh, one final uh, one final effort here. Um, I think that uh, what you say is uh, very, very close to the money there. I think that the Russians have reached a stage where they're actually winning this war and uh, they're probably likely to walk away if they play their cards right with the Treaty of Istanbul or something like that that was written three years ago. Um, but again, uh, they can't allow themselves to be attacked in the way in which they which they have. Putin is obviously over the years he's drawn red lines and ironically he's kept moving back away from them. I understand there was some uh, attack on uh, electricity supplies or cabling in the North Sea yesterday or the day before. What you said is true. There's so many places where Russia could make its uh, impact felt in Australia, and I'll conclude on this. It's actually going to be very, very hard for our conservatives here to deal with a maverick United States president who doesn't follow the normal NATO line. Uh, I'll be very, very surprised at how they'll accommodate that. We have a disgusting conservative type uh, news service here called Sky News, and it follows everyone as a hero from Benjamin Netanyahu to uh, God knows what, the latest CIA operations and attempted democracy, Hong Kong's democracy, everything's democracy. I think they're going to have a very, very hard time explaining away uh, where the world is actually going and during that period of free play that Donald Trump will enforce. Back to you guys. Guys, coming on that, Nath, just a bit of a response on that. That's uh, the cables that were cut uh, were 
I think in the Baltic rather than the North Sea. And apparently they are a couple of internet cables. Uh, very, very important, obviously. Not the modern economy, our society runs on the internet. They may not have been cut. Apparently 200 of these break per year. Anyway, it's something mm. that happens. You know, mm. uh, trawlers and so on break them. So it's not unknown. Mm. Uh, we are dealing, of course, with vast amounts of pro-war propaganda swirling through the media. So saying that these cables have been cut, it may be true. It may be Russia testing the waters, you know, or it may be uh, true, but nothing to do with Russia, or it may simply be a lie. It's in the same bracket as the the 10,000 North Korean troops uh, about to help uh, Russia to retake Kursk. It may be true. Uh, there's absolutely no confirmation of it whatsoever. There's no evidence of it whatsoever. Um, it may be that there's 10,000 Korean troops about, about to go into action. That wouldn't be about Russia needs them to win this war. As Jim says, they're winning. You know, the, the, there's regularly, day after day, a front here, a front there. There's two or three kilometers of advance. So they've broken through the main Ukrainian defenses. They're just grinding. The Ukrainian, the um, Koreans, if they are there, aren't there because Russia can't win without them. They're there because the new drone warfare that's really now become the way in which this conflict's being fought in, in very important ways. Uh, it's it's so new that militaries which are looking seriously at the prospect of war, and North Korea obviously is, are going to be wanting to use, if they can, Ukraine in the same way that both the communists and the fascists used Spain in 1936 to 1939. As, as a testing ground. So if the Koreans are there, they're not there because the war can't be won without them. They're there to get the experience of fighting a modern war. But the very fact that we're told they're there, and it's it's moved within two weeks, it's moved from being, there's rumors that they're there to they're definitely there, according to the media. But there's no evidence whatsoever to substantiate that change. We're still in the position that there's room that they're there. We simply don't know. So we have to be aware, even when we're trying to analyze what's going on, uh, it's very, very easy to take some of the mass media coverage mm. almost because they, it's repeated so often, it becomes a sort of fact, and it's mm. not. Uh, so all we know absolutely firmly is that, as Jim said, the Russians are winning this war. NATO has a choice, don't they? It's a simple choice. They've lost the war. They either um, proclaim victory that the Russians aren't already in Warsaw uh, and leave, so the Vietnam-style thing, or they just leave with that explanation, the Afghan point, and accept a, a huge demoralizing defeat, or they double down and end up with troops on the ground, and in particular bringing Poland into the war, which Poland's army is massive and very, very effective. Russia will beat them in the end, but that would entail you know, really serious losses, so they might do that. But their problem, of course, is that to escalate the war to that extent which they're trying i don't know if you've seen just the uh, the last few hours it's emerged not only did biden give them give the ukrainians permission to use these long-range missiles he's also now shipping illegal anti-personnel mines he's given the, the approval for that from america to ukraine and telling saying go away and use them so biden or the people pulling his strings are doing everything they can to escalate this war they're not insane. They're doing it partly, I'm sure, because there's great amounts of money for the industrial military industrial complex in it. And also because clearly they want to hand Trump such a, a, a convoluted mess in which American troops have been killed in serious numbers by Russia over the next couple of months. That's what they hope. This is about provoking Putin into, as I say, possibly uh, even small scale nuclear bombing if they need to or one of the mother of all uh, bombs, one of their thermobaric weapons on Ramstein military base uh, in Germany. That would kill perhaps several thousand American troops. And in their calculation, that would make it much harder for Donald Trump to say either I'm not interested in Ukraine at all, or to say we've got, you got to have a peace and impose it on Zelensky. So that's the key reason. It's money and about boxing Trump into a corner. And for that, these appalling criminals are prepared to get us all killed. Well, um, Trump is in this uh, context of it, tight, tight the night. Um, 
it's all about uh, how his victory impacts us. And uh, one thing uh, we can uh, take away from what we've observed uh, there in this astounding uh, result is that uh, it seems to be a resounding bell tolling for the legacy media, yeah. you know, and um, it, Trump has earned part of his success on the fact that he stepped aside from that and he went to uh, podcasters, a whole range from Joe Rogan to uh, much lesser known um, ones. Uh, so an interesting way to carry through on that would be to uh, to get rid or to favour the new independent media, I'll call them that for, for the sake of, uh, of this uh, statement, um, when he's holding press briefings. That would uh, be a clean sweep. And we already know uh, that... Uh, the uh, I believe it is uh, CNN over there is uh, counting its losses um, and is already uh, getting uh, checks ready for, for uh, mass uh, redundancies, mm -hmm. etc. So they're being absolutely dwarfed by um, by the alternative media. There, do you see it that way? I do. Uh, and of course, it's not actually, it's not just the legacy media that's taking a hit on this, because we think there's big, very big sections of the the new media, such as Facebook, such as YouTube, who are absolutely on the Democrat liberal side, and they've been sidelined as well. So this really is a victory for X more than anything else, and and the platforms like Rumble and so on, which allow podcasts to exist, uh, and it's a, a, a absolutely remarkable thing, uh, and I think. If the Democrats had won, they obviously would have then rolled ahead and steamrolled and basically one way or another got rid of X. And we'd have, by the next election, we'd have faced a position where there was only the legacy media and the, the new alternative media under control. Because Trump has won, we've got uh, the position that over the next few years, he certainly, as you say, he's not going to help the legacy media and Facebook and so on to reestablish their uh, their monopoly is he? Uh, if anything, he's going to help the other way. Uh, so you've got various platforms. Probably more platforms will actually emerge or develop, uh, as you say. If he simply says, "I'm not going to do any press conferences with mainstream media, uh, and all politics is going to be c conducted in uncensored alternative media," he will absolutely devastate them. And I think he might do that. The Trump, I think this Trump is very different to the Trump of. Uh, his first time around, he came in and he seemed really to have no idea what he was doing, and he was appointing people just at, at random who were who were essentially part of the uh, the Republican elite, and of course they surrounded him, handicapped him, and stitched him up. What he seems to have, I know that Jim's not there, I'm not there. You know, he hasn't put David Duke in charge of foreign affairs or whatever. So lots of hardcore naturalists aren't going to be happy. The certain, you know, obviously, oh, it's wall to wall Zionists. Yes, but the Christian right in America, unfortunately, is wall-to-wall -wall Zionist. They were wall-to-wall -wall Zionists long, long before Israel was even established. Mm. With those, it's not about Israeli money. It's not about Mossad's aversion. Uh, it's about the fact that, owing to the Schofield Bible, they actually believe this Christian Zionist heretical nonsense. So that's going to come with Trump. That can't be helped. But allowing for that, a lot of the people he's brought in, and you have got. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard is the best example of someone who's way, way from the left field, but uh, Kennedy as well and so on. You've got a range of people who I think they're not our kind of revolutionary, obviously, and it's not a co it's it's not a consistent. It's not there's no possibility of a consistent ideologically led, even sort of kosher nationalist revolution. But you've got people who aren't part of a system. Musk. He's a bit of the system. He's out of the system. He's rich enough to do whatever he damn likes. He's obviously it's this is uh, going to be a government of potentially revolutionary loose cannons. 
Now, they might all end up clashing and so on and rather dissipating their energy, but I think it's entirely possible that we are going to see a sort of revolution in America over the next four years. And whoever wins out of it, and it may well be the Netanyahu regime, so on, the winners, whoever wins among the losers are going to be the Democrats and the legacy media. So, Jim, uh, do you have an opinion on uh, that before we segue into that uh, second part uh, of, of the Trump influence on our domestic situation? Yeah, I'd uh, just take one point that uh, Nick's made very powerfully there. He's articulated there are certain vested interest groups that uh, help to develop Trump. If you take that as a general principle, locating aggressive, energetic, and self-motivated groups, whether they're in the system, outside of the system, whatever it is that they happen to be, is obviously a vector towards some sort of political change. Locating those groups uh, is a, an exercise. Uh, obviously, in Trump's case, he's got certain foreign policy agendas, so mobilising those Christian uh, evangelicals and, and, so off and so on was a, a logical course. But uh, completely neutral, forgetting what it is that they actually advocate, it's actually a masterstroke to organise people who have independent abilities to organise themselves. So your media then becomes them in the purest sense of the word. They are the media and however they express themselves, whatever technologies they use, means that you're outside of the mainstream, mainstream press and mainstream technologies. Just a comment. Now, the next question uh, I'm setting up uh, for Jim here, who has uh, something he particularly wants to address, but I'll say this. Um, we, we will have a lot of uh, well, it's everything from the right to nationalists in our own countries feeling a little bit emboldened or a, a little bit more optimistic having observed what's happened uh, and understanding the residual follow-on that will come from, you know, having Rome, uh, Pax Americana there, um, take such a radical flip. But we all know, and you pointed that out in your remark just before, that this is not, he is not a nationalist. What he's done is he's attacked the deep state there. Mm -hmm. Our worry here uh and there is what is the the domestic response do we look for uh our own trump do we decide that uh his uh his sort of populism which is not a dirty word um which is achieved on inclusivity which appeals to the conservative uh approach is the strategy to take would that therefore marginalize hardcore nationalists um and thus setting up off the um for what in australia has been the ongoing uh conflict between the conservative APA and uh the genuine thing so i'm gonna actually put this to uh Jim, so he can uh, clarify better. Yeah, look, um, I think in, in Australia's case, uh, there's a very, very energetic uh, conservative mobilisation and it's got links to uh, our Liberal Party. And uh, I've been uh, doing some research recently. I'm struggling to write an article that just gets out of control every time I try to write it, is that... Um, the links that are being made don't appear to make sense. And I'll actually use a, a British case, uh, Nick. I, I won't say too much because uh, obviously I don't want to interfere with um, uh, any British comments that uh, are appropriate. But as you know, you, you predicted uh, a year or so ago a major split uh, in a certain organisation there. You you told them that uh, they had some very negative elements inside them that were trying to stigmatise them as terrorists. And eventually they broke away from that group 
and establish something that, uh, you know, on one level appears almost to be a, uh, a neo-Nazi formation. And we found in Australia that those people were contacted by the ultra-conservatives. And uh, this is being documented in various ways. The ultra-conservatives that link the satellite structures to the Liberal Party are engaging with them. While the, the original group uh, has been engaged uh, with by people in Australia on the various masqueradings, I suppose, who could actually be characterised as neo-Nazis. But in Australia, the Conservatives speak to them backwards and forwards under, under the carpet as if um, uh, they're all part of a right wing. And uh, what I'm sort of uh, leading up to here, I think uh, in some ways Trump might actually pour some cold water on a lot of these, these efforts because by and large, I think the Conservatives here have all taken the side of Zelensky in Ukraine. And uh, where we're going with some of the discussion tonight about the, the affair in Ukraine is that if Trump is true to his word and he ends this war, he'll end it in a way that will probably show up what's actually occurred in Ukraine. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at some of these uh, developments here uh, in Australia very, 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 very oddly. Uh, we have a very energetic Liberal Party which has been absolutely masterful at creating, uh, I'll call them right-wing fronts over the many years. They're very, very good at it. And they rope in a lot of these so-called dissident right players, far right players, and all the rest of them into their machinations. Um, if we look at Italy, I, I was uh, looking at um, the Maloney, uh, the Maloney government, which has been one of the uh, main pushers of of Ukraine and so forth. Uh, she has her fans in Australia. She's a model uh, for a new uh, right wing mobilisation here. Uh, where I'm going with all of this is uh, taking from what you were saying before about Trump almost in an odd sort of way being a revolutionary. If we look at it from the point of view that he's a wrecking ball, um, mm. I think that uh, we're likely to find uh, in, in Australia definitely a lot of these people who have been uh, peddling lines and uh, uh, different things that can frustrate a lot of truly patriotic people. Uh, he's likely to pull the carpet out from under all of them, and we'll end up with an entirely different, uh, an entirely different playing field. So uh, that's where I'm coming from uh, on a lot of this. I, I think that uh, what's passed as conservative and so-called far right-wing politics here is about to get an enormous kick in the rear end, and that can't be a bad thing. And there are genuine nationalists here, and it gives an opportunity. Uh, these people have been hoping that uh, genuine movements could be sidetracked. They're likely uh, to find out this is not the case. So that's my thought. Well, Nick, <laughs> I think he's um, prodding you for uh, a response there. <laughs> that, that, that was a sort of circuitous... Uh, being discreet. Well, before my main point, was one point that um jim sabishat is important but it's it, it's a little thing of its own uh which is i think that we're going to one of the things that trump's team is already promising is that they're going to audit what's happened with the ukraine war mm. so yeah a lot of stuff is going to come out if they do as we know fundamentally it's a money laundering operation and they've got the potential with an audit there, not only to, to finally actually get around and lock them up like he promised the first time around. First time he, he made a big campaigning thing, lock her up, lock her up. He hasn't done this time. Um, I think we're far more likely to see people up, locked up this time than last time. And if they do it on the financial angle, it will also utterly enrage all American taxpayers if it actually comes out the extent to which they, they've, they've murdered a million men in pursuit of their own bank balances. Yeah, you know, truly shocking. So I think that's going to, be, going to be done. Very powerful stuff. Coming on to the main point, to Jim's point about sort of what this means for the right in general. I think first of all, and again, on a little scale, it shows the complete irrelevance of the neo-Nazis. I know that uh, as genuine nationalists, because we've been poked, prodded, interfered with and so on, by these little crank groups we tend to be rather i would say obsessed by them they feature big enough big in our world but in the grand scheme they are not big 
I, most of the neo-Nazis in America, or a large number of them actually were opposing Trump. Uh, and some of the sort of the, the gay intellectuals were opposing Trump because, of course, yeah, they're pro, uh, they're pro Ukraine, anti Russian for, for various reasons, including their own sexuality. Uh, and of course, with the neo Nazis, many of them right from the start, they're basically a modern version of the Gladio operation. They're all there working with the CIA in any case. And they've been exposed by, or made by this completely irrelevant. I think that in various places, because this is a populist victory, and it, obviously it's a stunning victory, so it's a populist victory, that's going to make it even harder for sensible, genuine, mainstream, on the edge nationalists, people like the British National Party were. Uh, you know, it's going to be even harder to make electoral progress because this is going to embolden all sorts of populists uh, in all sorts of ways, and it makes it clear that actually you can be a uh, an ideology free populist organization as long as you've got enough money uh, then you can actually make a big deal of progress so in britain with the first past the post for instance it radically will encourage reform uh, mm -hmm. to think that and people to think well we may only have got whatever it was at 14 percent and one seat this time around but next time we can come to power they won't all mm -hmm. i do actually is split the conservative vote but they're going to think for the next four years that's what's going to happen uh, and then after four years time, they'll have another excuse. So for probably a decade, we're going to have the position, partly as a result of this, where everybody is interested in electoral politics goes for the latest populist incarnation and the real nationalists are left on the side because none of us, past, present or future, have got the money and the, uh, the media clout of the, the pro-Zionist uh, alternative media to make really any progress. Well, that's going to happen. So what does that mean for electoral politics in the West? I think it's going to it's going to fragment in many ways. A key fragmentation is going to be the West. Obviously, we've been overwhelmed by mass immigration for various reasons, which we needn't go into here. But the West is divided in immigration terms into two camps, into two places. You've got the countries where it's late in the day to turn it round and save the old nation state people and the countries where it's too late to turn it around and in the countries where it's late in the day perhaps spain italy poland within a couple of years and mass immigration into poland has already started in the countries where it's late in the day i think the consequence of assuming trump does a fraction of what he's promising to do he's promising that he's going to expel 20 million illegals you know, that's an even bigger mass movement of people than occurred in germany at the end of the second or in eastern europe towards mm. germany at the end of the mm. world war mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, to to expel 17 million germans all the slavs had to do basically was uh, rape and murder a few hundred thousand of them a couple of million of them the rest all left for trump to expel 20 million when the only things he's got are law enforcement agencies and money it's going to be massively expensive i don't necessarily think he'll manage to expel 20 million but even he, even if he expels 5 million that will open the doors in the places where it's not too late in britain it's too late to turn around where we are now can't be done but in places say like italy or spain where it's not too late you'll see people coming to power who will also actually to a degree stop and reverse mass immigration in the places where it is too late and america is an example it's too late to turn back the clock to the basically white america of pre-1964 uh, but you'll see people following what Trump's done, where he's won by building a sort of a, an electoral pact, uh, a, 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 an, a, an electoral alliance with the grassroots by winning over huge numbers of Hispanic voters and a, a significant number of black voters. So it'll depend, the, the response in a Western country will depend on how far the mass immigration thing has gone. So there'll be different responses, fragmented mm -hmm. responses. I think to conclude, fragmentation is the key thing that the Trump victory is going to bring to the West in general, because the entire liberal elite, although Keir Starmer was immediately, you know, once Trump was elected, sending uh, congratulations and lovely and we'll be happy to work on, yeah. this isn't the case. So the, mm -hmm. the, the elite West is now riven down the middle between the the liberal elite, which includes, say, Britain's conservatives, probably your conservatives, 
and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, it includes them, them on one side and Trump and a few hangers on like Orban and so on on the other. So that's a fragmentation. But even within countries, it's also going to fragment things between people are, are going to look at what Trump does. It's not just immigration. You know, he's he, he clearly will move towards a degree of protectionism. Mm -hmm. So that then produces a response in or, or a, a challenge for the political elites of France, Germany, Britain and so on. Australia, how do they respond to that protectionism? By wailing about it and going ultra free trade. Some will do that for ideological reasons and so on. Uh, and others will actually have to swing towards a counter protectionism. So that means that Trump's victory for American protectionism would also produce protectionism, so a national response in some other countries. Not in all, it's going to be fragmented. It's, it just, um, it's it's interesting you uh you raised um uh, about uh trump and uh appealing uh more upon sets of uh, values and uh principles to to uh form to, to to get the support of uh the uh you know blacks and hispanics I saw a very interesting video of uh, Nigel Farage um, seemingly surrendering on the issue of Islam. Surrendering in which way? He appeared to be presenting your argument that the demographically insurmountable, yeah. so any notion of mass deportations or anything like that and uh is impractical and he seemed to be copying a bit of flack for it yeah what well, I, I, I assumed you would have seen that I, no i just wasn't sure sort of at, at, at what stage of what he's been saying uh, so i was just checking that so yeah um it's not a huge leap, actually, Farage, for Farage, because when he was working with the BBC in particular as uh, the bloc to stop the British National Party, part of the deal he did with the BBC was he'd, uh, he'd oppose East European Christian immigration, but he'd never oppose, he wouldn't oppose uh, immigration from the old British Commonwealth, and he would not criticise Islam. And he, at that stage, he went to various mosques and so on and tried to carry favour with the Muslim vote, which he didn't get didn't get it but he was nevertheless trying but he's only it's only in the last couple of years up until now when he actually began to put his toes in the anti-islamic water and i think there he's probably uh, looking at and uh, after money from you know the the people with the most vested mm -hmm. interest in clash getting us to clash with islam uh, and now in response to this i think see he's a very clever politician and he would have looked at what Trump's just done and thought, well, is this applicable in Britain? And of course it is applicable in Britain because just as you've got with the uh, largely Catholic uh, Hispanic immigrants into America, just as you've got a, a block there, which for economic reasons, you might expect to head towards the left. For cultural reasons, they're actually farther to the right than most of the indigenous population are. Uh, and so they've got the Mexicans in Britain, the the Muslim population in particular is the biggest traditionalist block that we've got. And if uh, Farage is thinking in four years time of really overcoming the conservatives, then the only way he could do it is to hold on to the the indigenous right wing, but also to add to it because the indigenous right wing is not growing for demographic reasons is shrinking he would have to do in britain what trump's just done in the united states which is to get the votes of the conservative christian right and of the conservative forget about being christian the immigrant right mm -hmm. so farage may well be thinking if i'm going to win or over overtake the conservatives and, and logically not win because with the right wing vote split you shouldn't be able to beat Starmer and the Labour Party, but they are making such a pig's ear of the thing. It's staggering how much they've lost support uh, and how badly they're doing that um, 
Farage may be thinking in four years' time this is possible. But it's only possible if he can get the Muslim vote on the basis of you don't want your kids taught trans stuff in schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, not lose the indigenous right wing vote by being seen to play footsie with a demographic, a group group which they absolutely hate. It's a very difficult thing to do. If anyone can do it, Farage can do it. Now I'm not a supporter, as you know, of Nigel Farage, but if anyone if anyone can make that transition transition in British politics, it's him. Now before I get to, uh, because we're obviously you've uh, got time limits uh, there, but uh, Keir Starmer, I heard an interesting rumour uh, that um, the uh, the uh, lad that um, committed the uh, atrocities that set off the uh, rioting in uh, Britain, that he actually represented his father. Um, for asylum in uh, in England. Yeah, that's been said. It's also uh, been debunked. Now, yeah. <laughs> of course, some of the fact checking debunkings, as you well know, yeah. are nothing of the sort. They're uh, being economic somewhere between between economical with the truth and downright lies. So I've seen this convincingly debunked. I certainly wouldn't repeat it because I think it's probably a lie, uh, because there is so much. It's not just the, the this sort of tale. It's not just people who are trying to uh, skew things in a political direction. It's also simply clickbait, because if you get a tweet which reaches 20 million people or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're managing, you make quite a bit of money out of it. Mm -hmm. So, so the the promote the creation and promotion of convincing sounding lies about everybody across the political mm -hmm. spectrum has actually been monetized mm -hmm. in the last couple of years by X, uh, as a result, and YouTube etc. as well actually. So, as a result of which, you have if something is so bad that it sounds fantastic from our point of view, you've got to assume it's a lie. I'm afraid. So, I don't believe uh, that. At the same time, I wouldn't be surprised. If, despite the debunking, it turned out to be true. Well, now, <laughs> yes, it's. Well, I got a five reef way on that one too. <laughs> That's a good one. We, we'll come to the last corner here of the the Trump uh, or the dilemmas facing him, and uh, the moral uh, questions left for the West um, over the chosen people, and I, I say that particularly because uh, this is their excuse um, for uh, the horrendous murder. And I, I didn't realise it was that bad, but uh, apparently in Gaza, the death count is up to something like 40,000 Palestinians. Now, this has just got to stop. And I cannot imagine how you're going to get Pax World uh even under trump unless there's some um accounting and and it needs to be much more than that it has to be uh a, a retribution against um the uh the the genocidal the maniacal genocidal uh adventures of the uh insane zionists jim you want to deal with that one first or me Sorry, I, I want it to be a free for all between you two. All oh, oh, right, look, um, I, I was going to throw in there was an amazing comment by uh, Assad a few weeks ago. He said that uh, he was discussing power blocks in the United States and he pointed out about the evangelicals and their support for, for Zionism. Uh, it's a very hard thing, and it doesn't matter what sort of uh, Christian a person happens to be, to on the one hand be fanatical in the pursuit of this uh, idea that Israel is on the left hand of God and condone what is in fact mass murder. It, it's it's obvious what it is. It, it can't really be concealed. You'd be suffering from cognitive dissonance if you could do it. So I think it's uh, what Zionism has done in practice is it's uh, undermined its own, uh, its own base, its own supporters. 
Yep, I'd agree with that. I don't I don't believe the figure of 40,000. I cannot see it's that low. I oh, think it low. may well be it's 40, yeah, it's 40,000 people they buried. Uh, I can't yeah. believe it's that low. Uh, you can't have a population under those conditions with that much bombing in such a crowded area with extraordinarily limited amounts of food and medical supplies and so on getting in, especially a population which has got so many children in it and only have that death toll. I think it's far more likely to come out at present. 100,000 plus. It is. It is a genocidal operation. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so where does that leave Trump? I think, well, during the campaign, at one point, uh, he said to Netanyahu, get this over with quickly. The question is, really, what, is, what did that mean? Because you can read that. It's get it, get it over with. Do whatever you like. Yeah. Or you can read it. Actually, it's quite a, a, an intelligent warning. This, you cannot carry on doing this for very long. Finish it quickly or it becomes impossible to support you. Mm. Uh, and I think we're getting to that position where it's really impossible to support this. Actually, it's impossible for America to support it anymore anyway than they're already doing. They've already provided all the weapons, that whether it's 20,000, 40,000 or 100,000, the weapons that have come to kill them have come from America mm. with American taxpayers' money. What more can America do? So it's not going to get any worse, I don't think. Uh, and uh, it, it, so it may just rumble on. The longer it rumbles on, the more the Zionists are losing the support of people around the world and making it harder and harder, even people, for people who actually want to support them, to put their heads above the parapet and say, I stand with Israel as they murder another 50,000. So that's changing things. I think that the most likely way that this will end actually is an internal thing. The Netanyahu's hold on power is very, very flimsy. And for all the weaponry and all the mass murder of children and women and so on, the IDF are not winning that war on the ground. You know, they tried to go into Lebanon repeatedly. They basically got kicked out each time. They're suffering for a, a small nation with a small number of people. They're suffering very heavy casualties. And all the stories that are coming out uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they were a couple of days ago, in fact, uh, there was uh, you know, a, a major demonstration by serving soldiers in uniform against the war. There's enormous uh, um, uh, resistance in Israel to what Netanyahu is doing. And I think this thing is most likely to end with some stage with the Netanyahu government falling and uh, a group of people who by our standards are still crazed, hate-filled extremists, but by Zionist standards are actually quite moderate. They'll come in and they'll end up with some sort of very imperfect peace settlement, just as all previous wars since 1948 have ended with, and they'll carry on pushing as many Palestinians out as they possibly can, and the Palestinians will carry on outbreeding them, and it'll just carry on for years to come. But in the end, it's harder and harder for Israel because what they've done this time has lost them so much support. So I don't see any enormous sudden changes or anything Trump does either way making a difference. This thing will drag on, then it'll go quiet for a while, and we're just back to normal for the Middle East since 1948. There has to be uh, an effect on the, uh, on the Israeli psyche. Now, I can't remember the name of it, but there was an animated movie made, uh, you know, possibly 10, 12 years ago um, about the uh, 1980, 1980s uh, Lebanon War. Dancing with Bashir, it was called. I haven't, I haven't seen heard it. it. Yeah, I haven't mm -hmm. seen it. I, I saw mm -hmm. it, and, and it was actually uh, deeply critical uh, of... Um, deeply critical of the Zionist leadership. There was another film made. It wasn't animated, but it, it was very much like that movie Fury, but uh, set inside a tank um, and uh, Israeli soldiers rolling haphazardly through Lebanon. And it, it expressed the, um, the, 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 the actual uncertainty and uh, fear that they faced mm -hmm. because there was no assurance as it wasn't uh, uh, a <laughs> uh yeah 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 but uh 
what we 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 also know that the, the, the people we do would tend to look at and point the finger at the most like you know say hasidic jews or the like uh, surprisingly a lot of them just don't um support what's happening mm -hmm. uh, there so so you'd have to uh, ask yourself how how much support there is in israel for this thing and uh the same way that um seeing the uh, uh images and uh the, the the consequences of uh the, the, the mm. american onslaught in the vietnam war affected yeah. the uh you know domestic uh domestic politics yeah yeah yeah, yeah. How, how that could uh come back and in, in future even uh weaken israel out of a sense of guilt uh, assuming yeah you know there's not more assuming i'm uh, assessing <laughs> the uh yeah, it's very likely as a matter of fact yeah in the in the long term yeah yeah, yeah. Bear in mind that one of the key reason that the netanyahu regime allowed hamas to launch their strike was because israel was on the point of civil war between netanyahu and his revisionist zionist crazy crazies on one side and the the the, the socialist Zion types uh, on the other uh, and that was a seemingly intractable problem which hamas helped him overcome but he's only he's only kicked the ball down kicked the can down the road it hasn't dealt with that problem uh, but as i say i i think that that will lead to a, a peace settlement this time around it won't lead to justice to the palestinians but it will lead to uh, an end to the killing and it'll settle things settle things down i think that's more likely than a war between israel and iran because mm -hmm. the israelis clearly have done everything they can to drag america into that war they failed so far very obviously they're not prepared to go it alone against iran i think that among the lies we're told by our mass media is the impression they give when these the, there's they've been these tit for tat exchanges the impression that the iranian weapons haven't done anything i think it's far more likely they've been devastatingly effective uh on the basis the targets that they've used and basically they don't want to admit that so the only chance the israelis have is to wait hence nothing's happening it's all gone quiet over there basically in terms of the real big confrontation they're waiting until trump's in and then there will be, if Netanyahu is still in power, there will then be a huge push. Watch out for false flags and all the rest of it to get America into war against Iran on behalf of Israel. So I think that the Ukrainian trigger for World War Three, like we said right at the start, if Putin handles it right and very sternly, but not too sternly, I think that that threat Will actually dissipate and that once trump's in that war will end but once trump's in we've got the risk probably in the very early months that the zionists and in the united states and israel will really do what they can to drag america into a full-scale war in iran and again at that point russia can't allow the destruction of iran uh, and the replacement with its a Shah regime or something like that, because that's rough Russia's stuffed underbelly. So if we dodge the bullet on World War Three in Ukraine, we're going to face another one on potential World War Three in a few months' time between America and Iran. I'm not saying it'll 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 actually happen, but there will be strong efforts to make it happen. Well, um, I agree. Mm. It's uh, it's it's. it's something now uh, th this is a bit of a personal question nick is is that your real hair it is I don't, have to wear a hat. I don't have to wear a hat because i have hair look it's yeah, real I, hair if you, I, look, I, if you look carefully you will see I, it is going gray I find, I, it, I, I find it most irritating because both you guys are, 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 are much older than me and oh, thank you, know, you for that thank you for that and, and and you've got this full head it just doesn't seem right not in the, uh, in the not of... <laughs> listen well, Nathan, my, not my dad lived till the age of 96 and he was just going a little bit thin on top 
By contrast, mm. my grandfather, one of them, was bald as a coot. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have to wear a hat to hide this problem. <laughs> but, yeah, I and I do not dye it. Well, I want to say one last thing. I think it's uh, incumbent on Trump to, uh, to to give a li to give a little too. When I heard him talk about the gas, uh, the Nord Stream, um, as if it was a given that uh, Putin had no right to sell his gas mm -hmm. to Europe, I find that an infuriating proposition. <laughs> why the hell not? You're supposed to be a capitalist. <laughs> why, the, why the hell can't he sell his gas? I mean, it was keeping <laughs> Germany alive, wasn't it? The, well, bear in mind that uh, Russia, sorry, uh, America and Trump and Texas and Republican states like that are doing extraordinarily well out of uh, the uh, Ukraine war and the sanctions. And we're buying I mean, large amounts of our energy in Britain are uh, coming uh, through liquefied natural uh, natural gas, some of, some of it from Qatar, but vast amounts of it coming from America. And if provocations in the Middle East close the Strait of Hormuz and so on, and the Suez Canal, then none of it will come from Qatar and we'll have to pay even more money to America for their gas. So especially once Trump is in power, of course, he's one ca going to ca carry that on. I'm going to say before, before we finish, one more thing in terms of what Trump is going to do, which is going to be very significant. I don't know how significant to Australians, but certainly to Brits and Europeans. Trump has made it very clear that he's going to continue the one sensible thing that I've come across that the Biden regime started, uh, whereby they... Uh, commissioned a report and so on, published only recently, uh, saying that they definitely are going to go ahead with a whole new generation of ultra safe, and they are, it's a far better type of technology, ultra safe, uh, medium scale nuclear reactors. So America and Trump has said, I'm going to carry on with this. So America is going to have safe, clean, and importantly, cheap and reliable energy going ahead over the next decade and two decades at the very same time as britain and western europe are, have committed energy suicide this means that so at present all the big german car companies are moving their plants out of germany they're laying off their people they're moving to brazil uh, so the the german economic miracle is finished not by competition but by destruction through this insane net zero stuff and trump's resisting that and he's he's not going to have any trouble from the democrats because they've started it so america is going to have safe cheap energy at the same time as britain and europe lose it all uh, and that means that our economies are screwed whatever any incoming populist nationalist governments do you can't turn around and rebuild an, an energy system within four years so that what they promise what they like, there's nothing they're going to be do, able to do. So this is going to have a huge economic effect, uh, impact on the relationship between America and the rest of the West, possibly excluding your good selves. I don't know. Uh, and that in turn will have one enormous factor. This will affect you. That in recent, the last couple of years, uh, Australia has, um, what's the word? Not, not kidnapped, but um, acquired thousands of British policemen and british nurses because uh they said yeah okay you can come here you get work permits yeah. uh and that little thing that's going to be dwarfed by what america's going to do a second term republican government if they have closed the doors to a fair bit of low-grade third world immigration they're going to be desperate for intelligent quality labor and they're going to be able to attract it because their economy is going to be a lot healthier than ours are. They're going to open their doors to a, 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 re, a recreation of the old mass immigration from Britain, Germany, Poland, Italy, and so on into the United States. It'll hurt it. It'll hurt Australia because you might want, perhaps, perhaps you don't, but lots of Australians will say, yeah, aging population, we need new immigrants. Uh, we would love to have Europeans. You won't be able to get them because they're going to be going to America. So you have no choice but to have Taiwanese and Filipinos. Sorry, folks, that's the way it's going to be because that's one part of the Trump revolution which will go ahead. Yeah. Well, I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> well, it's a good way to... We'll but, be thinking a lot. But but just on, on the subject of uh, the uh, uh, Europe um, 
being uh, uh, cowering before the uh, self-sufficient, energy self-sufficient America. Gee, if only Roosevelt had been alive, <laughs> that would have been his dream come true. But Well, okay. I suppose uh, we're winding up, are we? All right, gentlemen. Okay. Well, obviously, uh, Nick's got to get off and done. Uh, is, is it a Templars program? Uh, no, no. It's a... a, a British Freedom, so it's straight of France and, and co. It's, uh, uh, it's something I'm doing about. No, it's, it's, it's in simple terms, it's hardcore Christian nationalism. Well, oh, Nick, you and your natural hair can bugger <laughs> off. <laughs> Jealousy doesn't become you, you know. It's been oh, a pleasure. No, no. Thank you, gentlemen. A couple of months time. All right, we'll speak again. Good night for now. Good night.